Uh, thank you for coming to my presentation. Um, we're going to talk about uh, distributed compilation tools and trying to implement them uh, with Kubernetes. Uh, my name is Diogo Guerra. I'm a former computing engineer um, at CERN uh, with the Kubernetes team, uh, where I mainly focused on integrating tools ranging from monitoring, logging, and driver configuration uh, so that the users can uh, launch a cluster with all these features and to be available uh, with uh, our central uh, monitoring uh, on demand. Um, so once upon a time, around four years ago, I was a young computing engineer at CERN and uh, I was just discovering how awesome was Kubernetes and uh, how we could deploy and scale these applications that were load balanced by a service. And I used to live uh, with a friend which was a software engineer. And my friend, who at a Saturday, was trying to compile his tool. I was complaining that uh, the application compilation was taking too much time. And uh, I was turning to him, man, don't you have like a, can't you use like a distributed comp uh, compilation tool? Um, for sure, like there's something available, but he didn't know about anything. And actually, I had this idea like, uh, would it, because I knew about these tools and I was fascinated with Kubernetes, so wouldn't it be nice to like uh, use Kubernetes to scale up and down this uh, work, work, uh, worker, um, workloads and uh, like could we do a service with this and so um, come, we come to our motivation. So at CERN, uh, CERN actually has lots of many applications that are managed and contributed to by lots of managed, lots of many teams, small and big, and these solutions sometimes are not small and they are really, they really take time to compile. And here you have the two most common tools, which uh, is Root, which is a, a tool that scientists use to analyze and uh, visualize the large amounts of data produced by the LHC. And also we have our own read-only file system for software distribution. So this has some uh, problems, is that um, it's, it's problematic for a team to actually uh, manage this. So it's expensive to set up and maintain uh, in terms of um, manpower. So if you have different teams doing the same thing, you're actually losing resources. And it's also expensive to run because uh, if the resources just stay idle, you're losing money. So um, also it's my experience and I hope, I think yours too, that uh, users, when they use something, they opt for the easiest solution. And uh, sometimes it's uh, not easy enough and users don't do exactly what they should. Um, so from the challenges side, um, small, teams, small teams have lower budget. So usually maybe you could say that, okay, let's just buy a big machine and we solve your problem, but maybe this is not possible and maybe you don't want to buy big machines for all your developers, so maybe it would be best just to have some uh, distributed system where you can just compile and share with everybody and uh, everybody would take advantage of these resources. Um, on the organization side, this needs to be something that is uh, easily integratable with what exists because people will not just change um, in a whim, so it, it needs to be something that is easily integratable and it does the same job to be accepted. And there's not really a standard way that is offered to do this. So um, clearly we have a problem here. Um, and also one of the other things is that the user which wants to compile their workload will just use a public machine that happens to have more resources than what they have, but this public machine happens to be utilized by other users that are doing different things. And when you try to run a compilation job, you just starve everybody from CPU time. And uh, this is not good for the community because you will have 
angry users. So how can we help solve this? So we have some criteria that we want to uh, meet. So we want, we want this to be compatible with what already exists with uh, minimal effort. We want the user to be able to use this in an easy way so that it doesn't have an excuse of like, because the user defaults to use what is easiest. So if you present them an easier solution, if it works just as well, they will uh, actually uh, take this into account. And we really want to make this a Kubernetes service because why not? Huh? Um, so this is basically my experience and failures trying to implement these tools to run in Kubernetes. And uh, so the first one we tried was DCC, which is probably the most known one to compile C and C++. So the idea is that we have the worker pods that actually do the compilation service the compilation jobs, and we just scale them on demand by uh, the amount of work that we are actually doing. And basically, this would be backed up by uh, ingress and service, and we would be happy with it. But the problem is, like, this will not work. So the reason is why this CC is static. So before you actually do a compilation job, you need to define all the target nodes that you're going to utilize. And if you're scaling up and down, this will not have a good time because Kubernetes service will assign jobs to random workers and then the controller, which is the local, the user computer will not know which uh, worker has the job and it will be a mess. So also one of the big cons about this is that the client controls actually all the, um, the compile jobs. So you'll have back and forth between you and the cluster but this is common for the distributed tools. Um, so next one, we actually tried the spin-off uh, from this CC, which is called Ice Cream. And in this case, we have the same worker scaling up and down um, deployment, uh, backed up by a service, but we actually, it actually has a scheduler, which uh, does some auto-discovery for, for the containers that run the pods that run the, the com compilation jobs. So this works, but there's some caveats. Um, so we found out that uh, when, if we scale down uh, very fast, we might have problems because uh, the way the scheduler actually discovers the worker pods they will be killed and the scheduler will not be notified. And then when it tries to schedule stuff on this worker pod, it will fail. And if you have enough failures, the job compilation will fall to the scheduler and you'll basically be limited by the capacity of your scheduler. Um, so, also, uh, in addition to that, we have a very big problem, which is you actually need to compile the container where you're running the compilation job with the dependencies that your job is going to utilize. And this is not, it, this goes against one of our criteria, which is it needs to be easy for the users to actually utilize it. And we don't really want to manage these dependencies. So uh, is there a better way? So at this point, uh, there was no real stable solution. and like our idea was not really working, so we decided to drop it. Um, until a couple years later, there was a new uh, user that actually said, look, uh, do you have something? And uh, we said, well, we tried, but we didn't really find anything suitable. And he said, well, let's try with Escash. And uh, with Escash, we went. And here, the service works more or less the same way. Um, so the difference is that our worker pods will actually register with the scheduler and there's actually a heartbeat going on. So when the worker pods die, uh, the scheduler knows about it and will replace the failed jobs uh, to other worker pods. And um, here we can see that uh, we have a compilation going and somewhere in time there was a pod that died by mistake 
and uh, two of them were created in place of that, and uh, the compilation job finishes. Um, so there, there was a real advantage of using this. Uh, we found out that there's no need for dependency managing, so this actually removes a big hurdle for us because we don't need to maintain, uh, like the container can just be a thin shell of, like, uh, of the distributed compiler worker, and, and that's it. Like, you don't really need to add dependencies. Um, but there's also other some big cons. So the client needs access to the worker node because the scheduler will say, you can use this worker node, but the client will always submit the job to the worker node directly, and it will upload all the dependencies to the worker node if they don't exist. And also, Scash uses bubble wrap. So bubble wrap is a thin wrapper around the job, which basically isolates the, job, the kernel from the job. And this requires us to use namespaces, and thus we need a privilege pod. And also, the job limit is not supported in the worker nodes. And we found out if we submitted lots of load into the worker nodes, what would happen is that all these compilation job would be running, and we would be run out of RAM, and the job was just killed. And that's not good. So we presented this to the user. Look, this works TM. And uh, the user was uh, happy, but I actually was not happy. So uh, I questioned myself, like, can we go cloud native? And uh, I remember I had this talk with my friend a uh, long time ago uh, that um, he was explaining to me that many compilation tools actually create, create what is called a compilation database, which is basically like a registry of all the compilation commands that are run by the compiler. And at this point, uh, I was explaining to my team during lunch uh, all these ideas. Look, uh, this works. Uh, this doesn't really work because uh, there are these problems. And I explained them what this uh, distributed uh, com uh, database, compilation database was. And it's like, wouldn't it be nice if we could just do like serverless and we would just compile everything on demand? To which I was said that this was vaporware, and I was really triggered because of this. <laughs> and during that night, I went home and actually I was like, "There should be something that does what I want." And um, and actually, there, somewhere in a blog post, in a comment, I saw someone pointing to this project, which is called GG. So. Um, what we have here is we, it's an idea to implement this on Kubernetes, but with uh, a deployment that has the worker pods and the scheduler where the worker pods register to the scheduler in the same way that works with Scash. So the way the GG works, it's uh, through your compilation files, it will actually create a future with the ins and outs of the compilation step, and it will bundle them and send them to the uh, uh, storage, which we use uh, cloud storage like S3. Um, so I didn't really do this with the uh, Kubernetes. Instead, I wanted to use Knative. And the, because of lack of time, I decided to use something similar, like, I don't know, AWS Lambda. So, so basically what happens is that uh, the client is compiling, uh, is uh, inferring the, all the intermediate reference, this is what they call, and then they bundle all these objects and they send them upstream. And then they ask the scheduler, like, look, give me this, um, give me this binary, and the scheduler will create the dependency tree for this object, and it will resolve everything calling functions on the Lambda service. And basically, in the end, what we receive is just a binary. So there's actually a good thing here is that we don't actually need to interact with the, with the compilation workers. We just send the, the objects, and the, we get the result. So 
Uh, this is actually, uh, it fits very well in the cloud native ideology. Um, it's fastest or equal speed to what the other services like ICC and Ice, Ice Cream and BCC offer. And it's really flexible uh, and scalable because like we just limited by the amount of uh, pods slash functions that we can deploy. Um, also, uh, in the same way that Scash works, uh, it actually determines what are the dependencies of our compilation job. And uh, we actually don't need to do any dependency management, so this is actually really nice. The problem, though, is that this is a recent project, and it actually has zero or no activity, uh, so there's no users or development going on. And on top of that, there's some lack of supporting documentation. So to use, you can do their examples, but to do something like, uh, I don't know, backport this to uh, Knative, you need to actually fiddle around on how you do this. Um, also on top of that, because for example, in this case, root, which was the original project that we wanted to accelerate and help our friend Capybara with. Um, it's, it actually does some validation uh, during the compilation job. So because GG actually gives us the a future and not the, uh, the result that we expect, we actually need to take this into account and add it to the, and add it to the uh, project workflow. So it might, in some projects, it might be required some more integration efforts. Um, so I think there's no need to say, but uh, bigger nodes will always be uh, preferable because that's the way the world works, I guess. And, um, and this way we can look at distributed compilations uh, to be useful when uh, our friend is compiling an uh, application in his four-core laptop, or uh, some user is using a shared infrastructure, and uh, it should not be. It should use like some proper uh, distributed uh, infrastructure to compile the job. So we see that legacy distributed compilation tools do not really work with the Kubernetes because. They offer, they offer some things, but they lack on some other place. So there's not really a configuration that we could use. And there's a need for, like, there's a paradigm where you, we can take advantage of using distributed tools in, uh, in the cloud native dynamic. So uh, like we had the last example, which takes advantage of these very well. And if we have a Knative cluster with some spare resources, and we can just we can use this and create a service uh, for our users. So, um, if you want to have a look, um, I have a link here for the very simple uh, Helm chat that I did with Scash. And if I encourage you to check out the source for the GG project and the paper um, and if you're interested to actually contribute and um, uh, hopefully we can do something together about this and last and not least uh, I want to dedicate special thanks to all the capybaras that suffered judgment for your entertainment <laughs> sorry and uh, to Diana who helped to review uh, this uh, presentation and her tenacity to help me solve some last minute issues with the presentation. That's all I have. Uh, thank you for your attention. So I am not a specialist on compiler stuff, uh, but we still have lots of time for questions if you have some and I will try to answer them the best I can. Uh, can you do the mic after? Yeah, uh, yeah Jim. Uh, 
thank you for the talk. Uh, it is actually a very interesting talk. And uh, my question is, uh, do you think there, are there any cases where um, users want to do distributed comp compilation from Docker file? Um, for example, when you create uh, a container that contains uh, applications that uh, requires like a large compilation. And, uh, and if so, have you tried like a build kit, uh, distributed build feature? Uh, so, yeah, so, see my question. Uh, so that I understand you're saying that you have a Docker file and you actually do this compilation job inside the Docker file. And then, yeah, so yeah, this would work. You just need to have access to the internet or whatever we have your service. And if you just source the environment variables, which is pretty much how it works, like you just point out to the source remote uh, with the source with the S3 credentials and it should work. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. A very nice talk and very interesting. Um, I had one question around incremental builds, uh, and that is, um, how did, were you able to compare between someone building locally on their, say, like weaker machine, um, and then when they built the second time, so it's incremental and they should ideally have less to compile, how that compared versus sending it to build in the cloud again? Like, were you able to have it so, um, yeah. You know what I'm trying to ask here? Yeah, I think Thank I you. Do. So I didn't really test um, like performance-wise because that's a, a very lengthy process. It's more like an architecture overview and if it works or not. Uh, related to caching, um, so if you're talking about the GG thing, uh, so all, the, all your objects will be transpiled in an intermediate representation in the same way. So if they are still in S3, it will actually reuse them. So you got that covered, yeah. And you also have local cache. So there's cache in multiple places. So there's cache in client, there's cache, there's the S3 repository. And then if the client doesn't die, like in the case of the AWS function, it's, it's stateless, so it always dies. But if it doesn't, it has cache also locally in the build server. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Just one small question on top of that is, uh, is a second build um, where you make one change, you do one, like a second build right after, is it faster in the cloud than locally on slow machines? Um, I don't have information to answer that. <laughs> hey, that's no problem. Very cool, and thank you very much. Thank you. So I guess there's no more questions. Uh, feel free to contact me and uh, have a good day.